The scriptures tell us of the importance of studying God's Word. The psalmist writes, Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet, and a light unto thy path. In another place, he continues, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. We at Calvary Chapel Worship Center believe in teaching through the Bible in its entirety. May your faith be increased at the hearing of God's word. Here now is Pastor Rich. 1 Samuel chapter 17, we are now at the place in our study through 1 Samuel where we're studying about the story of David and Goliath. I mean, we love the story of David and Goliath. We just only get to study it whenever we come back around, you know, and uh, once every seven years doesn't seem like enough. Or ten years, whatever it is, you know, we come around. Let's ask the Lord's blessing. Father, we love you and thank you as we study this word We want to just receive from your heart. Lord, pour out the wisdom of heaven. Pour out the treasures of God to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we were studying last week, Saul was king in Israel. And he was disobedient to the Lord. In fact, the Lord said that Saul had rejected God. So therefore, God had rejected him as king over Israel. And it said that he would search out and find a man who had a heart after God. Of course, he was referring to David. And in fact, in chapter 16, we meet David, and we learn the details of how he was anointed. We're going to study that on Wednesday. But here in chapter 17 is the story of Goliath. And really, the story is about David, because we see here David's faith. And the victory that he has is nothing short of wonderful and amazing, but he becomes a great example for us. Now, we really need the story. We need to understand it because, frankly, there are spiritual giants, maybe physical giants in our lives, and therefore we need to understand the principles of David's strength and the wisdom that we can gain from it. Now, it says in chapter 17, verse 1, that this is the situation that the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they gathered at Sukkot, which belongs to Judah, which is to say they, they, there was an incursion quite deep into the territory. And they camped between Sukkot and Azekah in Ephes Demim. And it says that Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and camped in the valley of Elah, drew up in battle array to encounter the Philistines. Now the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, while Israel stood on the, val- on the mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. Now anytime, you know, Christians, believers, when they go to Israel, they love to go to the valley of Elah. And sure enough, when we went there last year, we were all looking forward to going to the valley of Elah. And of course, you know why? Got to pick up one of those stones, got to pick up a stone from the brook, you know, right there, and you got to just see it, and it's amazing, and it really is awesome when you stand there in the Valley of Elah, and you can look there on the west, and you can say, there, right there, it, those are the hills that the Philistines would have been on, and right there, sure enough, on the west, those are the hills that the Jews would have been standing on, there's a brook right there between them, and so I, I'm just like everybody else, I want to get a stone, you know, so I went down there, picked up the stone, still have it at my office, and I'm sure it's one of the four stones that David left behind. <laughs> and it's like, it really means a lot to me. And uh, so while we were there, I thought, you know, I would love to take a sling and, you know, throw a stone, you know. But we, I couldn't find a sling. I'm telling you, I was at the market, at the store. I was asking, does anybody have a sling for sale here in Israel? And I couldn't find a sling. Now, there's a business opportunity. They can sell a lot of slings. Uh, so I, what am I going to do? You know, I really want to throw something. <laughs> and we were down in the Valley of Elah, and someone had left some garbage, frankly, some uh, plastic thing. And I thought, I can make a sling out of this, you know, a uh, little MacGyver thing going on. All right, so, so I took this plastic, and I spun it all up, you know. And uh, so I, I held it in one hand between these three fingers, and I held uh, with the other one like this. And I put a rock in there. Now, you can't exactly spin plastic like that. So I thought, well, I'll just give it one go, you know. And I went, boom, and I let go of that. Oh, my goodness, I could not believe it. That thing just sailed. And then I thought, you know, the reality of a Jewish sling is really amazing. Because what they are 
is a long, long, two straps of leather with a, a pouch at the end of that. And you would hold it similarly over those three fingers and hold the other strap with these. And what you would do is you, you, would, you would just start uh, getting speed up as you twirl this thing and faster and faster and faster. And then at the right point, you let go with these two fingers. You let go of that top strap and you can send that thing really, really fast. And so you're there in the Valley of Eli, you see it all, you got a stone, and it just makes it alive. All right, so here it was, right here. And it says in verse 4, that a champion came out from the armies of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. So he's like nine foot, a little over nine feet tall. Now, it's interesting because when we were studying in Joshua, if you remember, there was a race of people who were known for their exceptional height. And there was a race of them, and they were in that area, and in fact, there was war, there was warring between them, and God had instructed, you know, Israel to faithfully, you know, to, to secure that area with great victory, but they did not trust God in faith to do it, the scripture says, and so here, all these years later, it comes back to bite them in the sense that here is this giant now troubling them greatly. And so it's interesting. It says that he had a bronze helmet on his head and clothed with with scale armor, and it said, which weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. And I think this is something like 150 pounds of armor. I mean, can you just imagine what the weight of this would be? And so you have this armor weighed 150 pounds, and you know, you think, well, what does this guy look like? Sometimes when you think about someone who's really, really tall, you know, you think of someone who's really skinny, you know, like Matumbo or something, you know, basketball player is really skinny, you think he'll break if he falls. And Goliath was not like that. Goliath was just a massive man. I mean, thick arms, thick legs, hairy, no doubt he's got to be hairy. And he's like, you know, he just, if there's one word to describe Goliath, that word would be intimidation. Last night when I asked at the evening service, I said, if there's one word that you could describe Goliath, someone said, giant. Yes, yes, that's true, but intimidation. That's the whole thing that, he, that, that we see. He had bronze greaves on his legs. Those are like shin guards made of bronze. Bronze javelins slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, huge. And the head of his spear weighed 600 shekels, but that would be like, what, 20, 25 pounds or something? And his shield carer also walked before him. Now, verse 8 says, He stood and he shouted to the ranks of Israel, and he said to them, Why do you come out to draw up in battle array? Am I not the Philistine and you servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will become your servants." But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our servants and serve us. Win or take all. Again, the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. I defy you. He's like right in there. I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. Now, when Saul and Israel heard these words, the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. No doubt Saul would be because he would be actually the natural choice for someone to go and face him. The scripture describes Saul as being head and shoulders taller than anyone else in Israel. And so if someone's going to go out and face a really tall guy, you'd think it'd be Saul because he was tall himself. So he himself was afraid. He didn't step up. No one had stepped up. And in fact, this had been going on for 40 days. It will tell us in a minute. Now, verse 12, David. Now David was the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem and Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. Jesse was old in the days of Saul, advanced in years among men. And the three older sons of Jesse had gone after Saul to the battle, and the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and the second to him, Abinadab, and then the third, Shammah. Now David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's flock at Bethlehem. And actually we read in chapter 16 that Saul and David knew each other in this sense. That when Saul had disobeyed the Lord, the scripture describes that the Holy Spirit left him. 
and he was greatly troubled of spirit. He had a troubled spirit within him. And so the scripture says that someone suggested that there was a man who was skilled in the harp, and he referred to David. So David would come, and whenever Saul was greatly troubled, David would play for him with this harp. And so he would go back and forth to his, to his father's sheep. And so it says in verse 16 that the Philistine came forward morning and evening for 40 days and took his stand, shouted the same challenge. Now Jesse said to, his, to David his son, <clears throat> Take now for your brothers an ephah of this roasted grain and these ten loaves and run to the camp to your brothers. Bring also these ten cuts of cheese to the commander of their thousand and look into the welfare of your brothers and bring back news. For Saul and they and all the men of Israel are in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So David arose early in the morning, left the flock with the keeper, took the supplies, went as Jesse had commanded him, and he came to the circle of the camp while the army was going out in battle array shouting the war cry. All right, so every morning they would all get up, put on their, all their battle armor and stuff, come out to the line and start shouting the war cry. Oh, 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 you know. But then, the, of course, the Philistine would come and they would run. So Israel and the Philistines drew up in battle array, army against army. David left his baggage then in the care of the baggage keeper and ran to the battle line and entered in in order to greet his brothers. Now as he was talking with them, behold... The champion, the Philistine from Gath named Goliath, was coming up from the army of the Philistines, and he spoke these same words, and David heard them. When all the men of Israel saw the man, they fled from him and were greatly afraid. Forty days this has been going on. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who's coming up? Surely he is coming to defy Israel, and it will be that the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches. Three things. Great riches will give him his daughter, his bride, and make his father's house free in Israel. That is to say, free from taxes. David spoke to the men who were standing by him and said, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach of Israel? Now notice this. For in verse 26, the faith of David becomes very clear to us as he says this statement. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? David is incensed, and I think David is a bit surprised. Why isn't anybody doing anything about this? How dare he? Who does he think he is? That uncircumcised Philistine, how dare he taunt the armies of the living God? Don't you all notice a God in Israel? And he's, he's, he's like incensed by what he is saying. You tell me who's, what is going to be done for the man. Well, the people answered in, in accord with this word, saying, thus it's so, it will be done. Now, Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the man, and Eliab's anger burned against David. His older brother, you can almost see an older brother doing this to David. And he said, why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? Which is to say, you're not doing anything important, David. You're just back there watching the sheep. And, and you come down here. I know your insolence. And I know the wickedness of your heart. You have come down here in order to see the battle. You just come down here to see some blood and some action. I know what you're doing. You know what's interesting? His oldest brother doesn't have a clue about what's really going on in David's heart. He doesn't know David at all, but God does. I love that part of the story. Isn't that wonderful to know? Other people may falsely accuse you. Uh, some people may doubt your heart, but God knows. God knows. And so I love David's response in verse 29. What have I done now? Which is to say, what did I do this time? Was it not just a question? So David turns away from him to someone else and said the same thing and the people answered the same thing as before. Now when the words which David spoke were heard they told them to Saul and so Saul sent for him. So David now talks to Saul and this is David's message. Let no man's heart fail on account of him for your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. This is David. 
Let no man's heart fail. I will go. I mean, in all the army of Israel, not one man has stepped forward. And David said, let no man's heart faint. I will go. Now, this is absolutely amazing. So Saul looks at him, and, and Saul said to David, You are not able to go and fight against this Philistine, for you are but a youth, but he's been a warrior from his youth. Which is to say, he's been fighting long, and you've been alive, David. But David gave an interesting answer. David said to Saul, Well, your servant was tending his father's sheep. Then when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And then when he rose up against me, I seized him by the beard and I struck him and I killed him. Your servant has killed both a lion and a bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them since he has taunted the armies of the living God. You can almost see David's strength of faith coming through in his, in his speech to Saul. And he will be like one of them for he has taunted the armies of the living God. What is David saying in this speech? God has prepared him for this moment. God has been doing things in his life that no one had known, no one had seen, but God had been doing something. God had been preparing him. You know what I'm convinced of? I believe that God is preparing your life as well. I'm convinced that there are Davids in this room right now, whether male or female, whether man or woman, there are Davids right now in this room that God knows your heart, that God has, has called you and, and is strengthening you and he is preparing your life even now. Now, when you look at David, one of the things that we know about David, in fact, it is what we hear first about him is his heart after God. He has a heart after God. He loves God. It's wonderful. But what is important to understand is that David wasn't born that way. In fact, no one is born that way. There must be a time, there must be a time in our lives when we open our heart. There must be a time. See, God changes the heart first. That's what we see in Scripture. God changes the heart first. There must come a time. In fact, the Scripture tells us that the heart of man is very dark. Notice Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately sick. And who can understand it? Now, if you've ever raised kids, you know this is a truth. You, you just watch kids from, you know, from their birth forward and you see something interesting. You do not have to train a child how to be selfish. They seem to know that right from birth. You do not have to train a child in how to be selfish with their toys because as soon as somebody comes along and says, my toy, well, then the other one will take that toy and bonk him on the head with it. No one has got to train him how to do that. He's born with it. You know, an interesting report came out from the Minnesota Crime Commission. They wanted to do a study on the, the reasons why people turn into criminals. And so they did this report, and this was their conclusion. I mean, this is the Minnesota state. No, they're not Christians at all. This is just an interesting conclusion. Every baby starts out life as a little savage. He's completely selfish and self-centered. He wants what he wants when he wants it. His bottle, his mother's attention, his playmate's toy, his uncle's watch. Deny him these wants, and he seethes with rage and aggressiveness. And, and this would be murderous were he not so helpless. He's dirty. He has no morals, no knowledge, and no skills. This means that all children, not just certain children, but all children are born delinquent. If permitted to continue in the self-centered world of his infancy, given free reign to his impulsive actions to satisfy his wants, every child would grow up to become a criminal, a thief, a killer, and a rapist. Interesting conclusion. And so, of course, we, we know that parents are to help shape a child to know what's good and bad so that the child doesn't grow up to be a savage, though he is born one. But 
God comes. And a person must open his or her heart in order to be changed by God. This is what we see in Scripture. Notice in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. Moreover, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will remove that heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh. So God, there must come a point, there must, must come a time when a person opens their heart to receive the Lord. How does he do this? God comes and knocks on the heart. God comes. He is the one who pursues. He is the one who says, I want relationship to you. God moved first. And in fact, it says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. Now this change may come when a person is young or when they are old. It's not too late. Even if you're old, it's not too late to open your heart to the Lord. My father was 75 years old when he came to open his heart to the Lord Jesus. Now, he had been a difficult person all the years leading up to that moment. But at 75, he made the decision. Whether you're young or whether you're old, there must come a time when you open your heart to the Lord. Now, going back to 1 Samuel chapter 17, what's interesting is this. David is now relating to Saul the things that had been happening in his life to lead up to this moment. And really what we see is that God is preparing him, and really we could say it this way, God is forging in David an excellent spirit. And this is true in your life and mine as well. If you have a heart after God, you can know this, that God is forging in you an excellent spirit. You know, Ellen Redpath once made a great statement. And he said this, the conversion of the soul is the miracle of a moment. But the making of a man of God is the work of a lifetime. I think, you know what? That's a right statement. You can receive the salvation of the Lord and the forgiveness of sin in a moment of time. I ask the Lord into my life, welcome, you are saved. As you ask the Lord to forgive your sins by the blood of Jesus Christ. But now, the life must be forged to make an excellent spirit. So David told Saul that he had already fought battles and won. He had been watching the sheep, and then if a lion or a bear would come and take a lion, he went after him and would attack, and he would kill the lion or the bear, whatever. Here's David, a shepherd, and he knows he's got to give an account for every one of those lambs. And that's why he would make a good king. He was faithful. I love Luke chapter 16, verse 10. He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. That's a great word. What a great help to us to understand. See, what we also need to see as we look at 1 Samuel and we study the life of David is that not only was he a man who had done awesome things to that point, God was preparing him, but he understood that he was doing this by the power of the Holy Spirit. It tells us in the previous chapter that when Samuel anointed him, that the Holy Spirit came upon him mightily. And here's the word that we need to understand. The same Holy Spirit that anointed David is the same Holy Spirit that fills you and me even today, even right now. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, he has given you the Holy Spirit of God. And it is the same Holy Spirit that filled David and anointed David. The same power resides in you that resided in him and in fact in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there's a wonderful encouragement to understand. And in fact in Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6 it says this, Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. That's the strength of his life. That's the power which he understood. Now, 
one of the things, of course, that we heard about David, as I mentioned, is that David has a heart after God. What does that mean? He has a heart after God. What does it mean? It means that he loves God. Loves God. See, here's what I'm convinced when I look at Scripture. I'm convinced that God blesses the heart that loves him. That what God really desires is a heart that loves, an intimacy and a nearness. You know, when David was out in the fields watching the sheep, he's out there all alone. What was David doing? You know, watching the sheep is not exactly the best job. It's obviously relegated to the youngest, you know. And so he's out there watching the sheep all these hours all alone. What's he doing? Well, what we see in Scripture is that he's playing the harp, getting quite skilled with it, writing psalms. Psalms would be like our modern day, you know, worship songs, you could say, because people would sing them. And the harp would be like the modern day guitar. You know, don't you just love it when you see young people learning the guitar? I mean, I, I think it's really marvelous because, you know, at first they start to learn the guitar and at first it's just technique, right? What's this chord and how do I make my fingers? And all oh, that hurts. And, you know, and they're just learning and playing. But an interesting thing starts to change in them. Because after a while, they're not just playing chords anymore. What you see is that they start to transform. They, they start to have passion after God. They start to play and they start to worship. Don't you just love that? I love to watch young people as they learn that instrument and then they start to pour out their heart. It's not like they're trying to get attention to themselves. It's like, hey, watch me. Aren't I wonderful? No, 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 no. What I see is passion after God. I love it when young people just like praise the Lord with their heart and they're playing the guitar. And I think that's just like David. That's just like David. When, when he was out there with his harp and writing these psalms, he was loving God. That's what he was doing. He was just loving God with passion. You know, when David was writing those psalms, I'm convinced that he didn't later say, hey, these are, you know, these are good. I, sh I should get a publisher. He wasn't writing them for the purpose of publishing them. He was writing them for God because it blessed his heart. And so you see that heart coming through in what he wrote. Psalms 23, Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Here's his heart. Look at Psalm 8, verses 3 and 4, and then we add verse 9. This is awesome. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars. You can just imagine David out there, all you know, those hours, late at night, staying out even with the sheep overnight. Can you imagine him just out there, just looking at the stars? Wow, God, God is amazing. Look at those stars. It really is awesome when you think about it the other day. We had an elders meeting the other day, and some of the times our elders meeting can go long, you know, because we like to talk and we like each other, so we talk a lot and have fun. But we get work done, too. But we're at this elders meeting, and, and I don't know how exactly it happened, but we started talking about the stars. And I remember this, like, wow, this was just a, a moment of, isn't God amazing? Think with me. Just think with me just for a moment. The stars and the handiwork of God's hand. It's just amazing when you think about it. The stars and the light that comes from the stars is just amazing. And we were talking about, you know, the DNA. And, you know, evolutionists will say, you know, the DNA, uh, you know, just assembled itself by, you know, by coincidence, you know. Are you kidding me? There's like 64 megs of information all perfectly assembled in this double helix with self-healing powers. This is amazing. What a declaration of God. It's like, oh, isn't God amazing? You go out to the stars at night. Have you ever done that? It's like, wow, God is good. You ever go out to the stars and think for a moment, do you realize that the light from those stars, I mean, photons from those stars are coming into your eyeballs? Okay, let's go back. So when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man 
that you should take thought of him, and the Son of Man, that you should care for him. He says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Or Psalm 19, which Greg read earlier, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. See, it was the heart of David. It was the heart that God saw. That's what God was searching for in a man that would lead Israel. I don't want a politician. I want a man who has a heart after God, a man of faith who will stand on that faith. That's what I want. A man who will lead Israel because he loves God. Notice what he said. This is what God was saying to Samuel. Go back to 1 Samuel chapter 16. Look at verse 7. For what had happened was, Samuel came to Jesse's house knowing that he was going to anoint one of these boys. And so Samuel said, bring, you know, bring your sons. Well, Eliab came and he was a tall man. And so Samuel said to himself, oh, this must be him. But verse 7 is so helpful. The Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, I have rejected this one. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Oh, that's good. That's good. You know how we are. We tend to look at the outward things, don't we? I mean, you, come on. We know how we are. We get, you know... It, when we see someone who's highly esteemed, we start to show favoritism. Someone who's really, really wealthy. Oh, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. Or someone who's, you know, super powerful or well-known. Oh, yes, sir, yes, sir. Not so with God. God is no respecter of persons. God is not so easily impressed. What is it that impresses God? heart that loves him. That's what he wants. That's what he desires. You know, you could get today a doctorate of theology. Wouldn't it be awesome to have a doctorate of theology? You know what that means? That you have a doctorate in the study of God. Can I ask you a question? What good would it be to have a doctorate in theology unless you were sold out, flat out, in love with the Lord Jesus Christ? What good is it going to do you if you're not absolutely in love with Jesus Christ? You can have a degree in the Greek language. I used to know a fellow. He would say, I would come to teach, and I wouldn't even bring my Bible. I would bring the Greek text. I could preach right out of the Greek text. Wonderful. Can I ask you a question? What good is that going to do you unless you are flat out, sold out, in love with the Lord Jesus Christ? Isn't that what God desires? God sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outside, but God looks at the heart. 2 Chronicles 16, 9. The eyes of the Lord search to and fro throughout the whole earth. Searching right now. There are Davids in this room right now. There are Davids in this room. And God will look at your heart. The eyes of the Lord search to and fro throughout the whole earth in order to show himself strong in behalf of those whose hearts are perfect or completely his. That's what God is looking for. Now, let's go back to the story of David. Notice what he says in verse 37. David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go. Go. And may the Lord be with you. It really is amazing when you stop and think about it that Saul is allowing the boy to go. But I'm convinced that Saul looked at David and said in his heart, there is something about this boy. There is something about this young man. I'm going to trust this. So it says... Saul clothed David with his garments and put on the bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with his armor. That part's almost comical. Because Saul was, you know, this really tall guy, well over six foot tall, big old helmet, bronze helmet, all this armament. 
and puts it on David. And it says in verse 37, David girded his sword over his armor. He tried to walk. And you imagine trying to walk. It's like a youth wearing, uh, you know, the kids of the kid's father's suit that's about five, ten sizes too big, and he can't even walk in it. And he, so he took it all off. He said, I can't wear these. Verse 39, I can't go in these. I haven't tested them. And David took them off. And so he took his stick in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had, even his pouch, and the sling which was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. So now we're going to see David is going to face this giant. And this is important for us to understand. We need this insight because here's the truth of it. Everyone faces giants. Everyone faces giants. There is something in all of our lives that we need to have victory over, whether it be an, a, a, a medical condition. Maybe you had no understanding or expectation that this would happen to you. But here you are. And this medical condition, and, and it's like a giant, it overwhelmed, I don't know what to do. You know, I saw the testimony of a man who has no arms and no legs. All he has is a torso. And I remember, think, I'm a, I was amazed at this testimony. For you could see in his eyes a love that he had, the smile that he had, the eyes were so bright as he spoke of the love that he had for the Lord, and he was convinced of the love that God had toward him. You want to talk about a medical condition. And he said, I remember so clearly, he said, I stopped asking the question, why? Of course, everybody wants to know why. I've stopped asking the question, why? I now ask only the question, what? God, it's enough for me to know that you know why. I want to know what. What is it you want to do in my life? For I will go where you want me to go, and I'll do what you want me to do. And you know something? Hundreds of thousands have come to faith in Jesus Christ because of the power of that man's testimony. Now that's a life of significance. Some medical condition, some giant. You lost your job in the midst of one of the worst economies we've ever faced. Something's got a grip on your life. Some thought that you can't get over. Some hurt that you can't forgive. Some sin that seems to have power over you. We need to know how to have victory. And that's what we see. Because what we see in David is the strength of his, the faith of believing. Notice what happens. Verse 41. The Philistine came on and approached David with the shield bearer in front of him. Now, when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained them, for he was but a youth, though ruddy and handsome in appearance. I thought that was interesting to add. And the Philistines said to David, am I a dog? He's actually insulted. This is who you send out? I've been taunting Israel for 40 days. Send out a man to fight. And what do you send me? Is this for real? You send this boy? Am I some dog? Did you come to me with sticks? So the Philistines started cursing David by his gods. Cursing is, that's how you show that you're really a man, you know. I hope you don't believe that. The Philistine then said to David, You come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. Intimidation. Intimidation. You know what intimidation does? Intimidation will beat you down and wear you down. That's what he's been doing for 40 days. Send the man to fight. You got no one to fight. And as soon as Philistine would, the Philistine giant would arrive on the scene, everyone would start shrinking back. No, not really. No, not really. And they start shrinking back in fear. And he just kept taunting them and beating them down, beating them down, making them less and less and less. 
And you know what the enemy would love to do to you? The, the enemy would love to beat you down. The, the enemy would love to convince that you're less and less and less. But David was not beat down. David would not be intimidated. And I love his speech. He says in verse 45, David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have just taunted. I love that speech. Man, I love the strength of what he just said there. You come to me with weapons of the flesh, shields, sword, and javelin. I come to you in the name. I come to you in the name. You got a sword and a shield and a javelin. Wonderful. I come to you in the name. For the name is the most powerful name, the name which is above every other name. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. you know what Lord of hosts means? It means captain of the armies of heaven. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, whom you have just taunted. David is not intimidated. You know why? Because faith builds up. Faith strengthens. David's faith is what we see. Because here's the key. Faith is the victory. I want to know, how do I have victory over this giant or this terrible thing? Uh, how do I have the victory? Faith is the victory. It means relationship to the Lord. It's not faith for sake of faith itself. It's faith in believing in who God is. I come to you in the name. I know who He is. I know that He is for me. I know that He will never leave me. That's His answer. I come to you in the name, He says, verse 46, and this day, I bet Goliath had never in his life had anyone ever speak to him like this. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down, and I'll remove your head from you. And then he turns. Remember what Goliath said to him? I will take your body and give it to the birds of the sky. David turns to the army of the Philistines, and he says, And I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth. Notice this. So that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Some famous atheist once said, prove to me that there's a God. And the answer came back, Israel. That's all you need to say. You look at the history of Israel and you will see the hand of God. And so, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And I love this part here, verse 47. And so that all this assembly may know. You can almost see him turning to the armies of Israel. Would you listen to this now? That all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear. That's a great word, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hands. It's an amazing point. See, David's faith is what we see. David made it clear in verse 37, The Lord is the one who delivered me from the lion and from the bear, and the Lord is the one who will deliver me today. The Lord. See, this is what we see. Notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3-4, through 4, he says, Paul writes, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. When David slung that stone, it was not just a stone. It was a stone that was sent and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm convinced that David was good. He was good. He practiced. I'm sure he practiced. I'm sure he's out there, you know, I mean, he's playing the harp, but after a while your fingers get sore. I'm sure he had to practice. So he's out there with a sling, you know, and he's practicing. Oh, zing, you know, there's a rock over there. Zing, you know, there's a can over there. Zing, or pottery, whatever, you know. And boom, you know, he's practicing. All, you know, he's practicing, practicing, practicing. I'm sure he was good. But I'm convinced that there was no way David was going to miss. 
Because God had ordained this day. And God had ordained the victory. And he was assured of it. And David was assured of it. The victory had already been so seen and already been known. This is what Paul meant, I'm convinced, when he wrote to the church at Galatia, in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live. It's not, long, it's not I who live any longer. It's Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. The life that I now live in this flesh, now I live it by faith. This is the key. Do you want victory? Do you want victory? Here's the key. The weapons of our warfare. See, God does not deliver by sword or by spear. The battle is the Lord's. There's the key. There's the key. The battle is the Lord's. That's what we need to understand. That's the key for David's willingness to face Goliath. His being convinced that he would not be reduced by Goliath's taunts. For he had been strengthened in his faith, believing that God would walk with him and be with him and the victory would be his. Now when we hear that phrase, the battle is the Lord's. We see that throughout Scripture. It comes back again. When the king Jehoshaphat, later the king of Judah, faced his enemies, he, came, he declared a fast of Israel, and they fry, cried out to the Lord, and the Lord spoke through a prophet. And this is what we see in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15. The battle is not yours, but God's. Station yourselves. Now, this is important here. Station yourselves. Stand and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear. Do not be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out to face them, for the Lord is with you. One thing you got to see about David, one thing you have to admire about David, he faced it. He believed God, that God was able, and he went out there and he faced it. And that's what we see from the story of Jehoshaphat. Go out there and face it. See, you want victory? We all want victory. You're not going to get victory by running from it. Face it. Face it straight on. But in faith. In faith. Believing that God is with you, He will stand with you. He, God never promised that we won't have problems. What God did promise is that I will walk with you through every trial through every difficulty. There's an old saying, if you're going through hell, don't stop. <laughs> you keep walking, you keep facing it, you keep going and God will walk with you. He'll walk with you every fire, every difficulty. You keep walking. That's the key. I want to end with this verse. Luke 18, verse 8. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? That's the question of the day. We want God to move in our church. We want God to move in our lives. The key is faith. The key is believing. We need to believe God for more. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? Let him find it here amongst us. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for you for your heart after us. Therefore, we have a heart after you. God, God, we know that there are Davids. May we be a room filled with them whose heart is after you, who love you. Lord, we know that you would be the one who would prepare our lives. That we know that you would desire to forge in us an excellent spirit. But Lord, we need to be victorious. And whatever giant it is, whatever difficulty it is, we need to be victorious in it. Lord, help our faith to arise. Help our faith to be strengthened. Lord, we know that you bless the heart that loves you, so we love you with our heart. Faith is the victory. We trust you. We stand on this rock. We stand on this foundation. 
Church, as we're praying today, man, if there's anyone here who needs to say to the Lord, I take my stand with you today. I've been intimidated. I've been broken down. I've been defeated. But no more. I take my stand with you. I know that you'll walk with me. I know, Lord, that you'll stand with me. Strengthen my faith. Strengthen my faith. For I need the victory. And Lord, I'm asking that you would walk with me through it. I need the victory today. Would you just raise your hand and say that to the Lord? Say that to the Lord with boldness of strength and faith. I stand with you. I need the victory. I'm asking that you would move in my life and my heart. God bless you guys. God bless every one of you. The spiritual boldness to ask the Lord for what you need in your life is rewarded because you have faith to believe. God rewards those who seek him in faith. Father, we love you. We honor you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, I want to remind you that there's a prayer room today. On behalf of Calvary Chapel Worship Center and Pastor Rich Jones, we thank you for ordering this message. Our prayer is that God will use it in your life to increase your knowledge and your love for Him. If we may serve you in any way, please contact our church office at 503-642-2003 or on our website at www.calvaryhillsboro.org. On behalf of all of us at Calvary Chapel Worship Center and Pastor Rich Jones, May God bless you.